Hey y'all, I've made an actual playable demo game for my Taka Wasm app player for the first time. And this included requiring a bunch of new features supported such as multiple buffers and pipelines, instancing, depth testing, keyboard control, multiple uniform buffers. There's a lot of other little things that go into getting all the details right that get things working to the extent they are now. And as before, the app player has both a native version and a version that runs in web browsers. Let's look at some details of what I've been doing. And for a bit of context, here's the demo I showed in my last video. And here's an updated version of it that has these spinning squares going around with a bit of translucency on them. Let's look at the difference in the code between these two demos. Here's the diff in the zig source between the old version of the triangle demo and the updated version of it. And this really is the entire program. So right here we see the construction of the triangle in question. And I modified the shader, we'll look at that. And I had to be more explicit. By default, I give you a default pipeline, but now I have to explicitly create it because I'm gonna make a separate pipeline in a second. And by pipeline, I mean it's possibly different shaders or other details involved in how the rendering is going to happen. And here's the buffer for both the square and the repetition of the square. I was just trying to see if I could pull this off. So for example, we see there's one, two, three, four squares, and each square has one, two, three, four points on it. And that's what's going on here. I actually have the same vertex coordinates for both each individual square and the four squares. And here's just which vertices we're using to build the two triangles that make each square. And then notice here that I'm using different fragment and vertex shader entry points in order to do this. And I've also said, please reuse that existing attribute for the squares in order to be the instances as well. So I'm gonna have four instances of the square. And then I need to remember these extra buffers and pipeline so that I can make use of them instead of just the single default I had before. So here's what I had before, drawing one instance. And I've added this additional work here to use the extra pipeline for the decoration. And then I need to say, please use the buffers as well and draw four of them. And then the text and frame counting were as before. For looking at the difference in the shaders, we see the same thing as we had before, but in the same WGSL shader source file, I have two additional entry points for the new vertex and fragment shaders. And these could be sharing other helper functions. Minimally, they are sharing the same uniform definitions. And here, I rotate each individual square as well as offsetting them to the, each of the four separate squares before rotating again, which is how we get the squares individually rotating and all of them rotating together. And if we build this demo, we see that the older version without the squares is 1590 bytes and the updated version is about 2400 bytes, both of these after LZ4 compression, which I allow on my Taka app binaries. Then the web player or the native player just loads up this binary and runs it. But let's take a look now at my actually playable demo game, which I wrote in the C3 language because I like to mix things up a little. So one thing I did was I actually used multiple source files and structured it as sort of a project, even if I still was rushing it. And the other thing I did is I actually exported these meshes from very simple things in Blender. For example, here's the spaceship, which you can't ever see the front of while playing the game. I'm not really a 3D artist at all, but also by having simple models, it means the game size is small. But this is a proof of concept of exporting models from Blender and of letting it do some work for me, such as calculating the surface normals. Anyway, so I did write my own GLB loader in C3, which is not fully featured, but does get me the meshes and the data I need from them. And I was able to take advantage of the built-in JSON parsing that the C3 standard library has in it. And it's nice just to have these files directly embedded, which means I can just reference the binary data directly without having to do any new fresh allocations for them. And I have only one shader this time, but it's exported to two separate Spear V files. And I wrote the shader in HLSL. We'll look at it a little bit later. And I also create only one pipeline, where I now have the attributes split across different buffers. It starts with the position of each vertex, the normal of each vertex, which helps with the shading, and the instance locations. I only have one mesh up for each of the kinds of shapes here, including for the gems and asteroids. I just use instancing like I did with these squares here in the shapes demo.
And then I keep all the game state inside of a game struct. And then at each update, I see which kind of event I have, whether it's a frame event to draw a new frame and update the world state, or whether it's a keyboard event. And I might have other kinds of events in the future, but these are the kinds I have in Taka today. And I use this C3 pool feature for resetting the temporary allocation after each event. And I just use temp allocator for everything here. So very little in the way of memory management. And here are my Taka bindings. One of the interesting things about C3 is that it focuses on CABI compatibility by default. So while my extern things here help it know that it should find the function elsewhere, it presumes that these functions are going to be compatible with CABI. And the slices also, for example, in C3 are presumed to be stable in terms of how they'll be presented externally. And by sheer convenience, I happen to already be using pointer then length in my slice handling in Taka, such that I could use C3 slices directly with no conversion. In this contrast with Zig, where slices are not guaranteed to have an externally stable representation, so I copy them into my own span type instead. Same thing for structs. If I want to make sure they're externally stable, I have to say extern on them. And in C3, I don't do that because that's the default presumption in C3. There's pros and cons to this. It has different effects on the language. But just show an example of how C3 tries to be closer to C in the various things it does by default. Anyway, to draw each frame, I first actually do updates on things, including game pause handling. I spin that light around. I move the asteroids and gems toward you. Then I handle the control state based on the keyboard events. Then I set up drawing. Note here that I have built-in matrix functions in the C3 standard library as well, which is super convenient. I don't know how many apps out there need them, but I needed them. In any case, for my uniforms, I actually control the color and explain better what uniforms are. They're basically things that whenever I do some kind of drawing call, no matter how many triangles I'm drawing, the uniforms stay the same throughout that entire draw. So this controls my viewpoint, and I also control colors. So I say, whenever I'm going to draw those boulders, they're always going to have this color. Whenever I draw those gems, they're always going to be green. And eventually I draw the ship, and also format some text for the total points and the time that's passed. And we'll get back to these uniform updates in a minute, because that turns out to be an interesting difference between WebGL and WebGPU, and what I have to do inside of the Talker runtime. So let's look at the shader quickly. This is HLSL, which I don't feel very expert about in the terms of the differences between this and WGSL, but I hope to explore it more in the future. And down here, I'm using those projection and view matrices that I built in C3. And here I'm controlling the lighting. One of the fun things you can do in shaders is have some of your logic that's running on the GPU only. So for example, my rotation of my ship, and in fact, everything else, is always facing toward the center of the screen. And that's handled here automatically inside of my shader. So for example, no matter where I go, everything goes to the center. All those gems are pointing toward the center. That light is pointing toward the center. And actually, even the asteroids are, although because of their shape and shading, it's not always obvious. And that's done inside of my shader here. Now, HLSL, or high-level shader language, is typically promoted by Microsoft for Direct3D, although used in other things such as Unity. But they also have an open source compiler for it. That's DXC. And even though I have only one source file, DXC wants to create different output files, whether for your vertex or your fragment shader. So that's why I have two different Spear V files in this demo. Then I compile C3 to WASM. I optimize that. LZ4 compress, and put my Taka binary into place. But one of the reasons I make sure to use Spear V for my shaders in Taka versus, say, WGSL, is because if the shader format is binary, it means you won't be writing it by hand, which means you'll have to choose a tool, which means you also are likely to have diversity of choices in your shader languages. I mean, you could always compile anything to WGSL or to GLSL, but I like the idea of making things binary. So let's make sure to build this to prove that we can. And let's resize here a bit. And we see that this demo is over 40K in size. And that has a lot to do with things like bringing in the JSON support and allocator support and string formatting and so on and so forth. Still, I'd say that's a respectably sized binary for all the things that it's doing. And I might be tempted to figure out how to put small GLB support directly into Talk in the future at some point. 
such that you can just load up exports from Blender out of the box, for example. And I'm not quite sure how or if I want to do that yet. And then I can run my binary with my native Taka player. Here we are. You can also go full screen. And the Taka player itself for Linux currently compiles to about 11 megabytes. This presumably will get larger as it add more features like audio and image and video formats to it and so on, but still not so bad. Anyway, like I said, let's focus on just one thing here, which is how these uniforms are handled in WebGPU versus WebGL, because it's actually very different. And my web player is mostly a completely independent implementation of everything, except for Spear V loading and LZ4 decompression. And this is primarily written in TypeScript versus my native player is written in Rust. Let's take a look here at how the uniforms are handled in the TypeScript. In WebGL, typically when you do a draw command, it goes immediately to the GPU. So I basically have only one uniforms buffer that I copy things into. When I update the color for the gems or for the asteroids or for the ship, I just update the color and I draw what it looks like for my Taka usage here. And literally that's what happens in the WebGL version. I update the uniforms, I ship them over, then I call draw. But the same thing does not happen in WebGPU, or rather WGPU, which is a Rust implementation designed to support WebGPU and browsers. I don't use WebGPU and browsers yet because it's not really widely supported or even finalized as a spec. But in any case here, I have different bind groups, each of which has its own uniforms buffer for the WGPU implementation. And I have to have multiple bind groups such that each application of uniforms actually makes a difference. Because in WGPU, you actually package up all your commands and ship them at once to the GPU. I presume that's for efficiency reasons. Instead of communicating over and over again, you communicate typically only one time for a batch set of draw commands, which means I can't have just one uniforms buffer. So I automatically behind the scenes keep track of a VEC of uniforms buffers instead. And here I'm stepping through which one I'm going to use next. If I don't do that, then presumably I'm going to only have one uniforms buffer. So let's rebuild this, which actually takes a while. It's much easier just to reload the TypeScript being built by Vite in the web browser. I think this is slow because of the Wasm engine and so on. But notice here that when I stop using multiple uniforms buffers, the last update is the one that counts, which is for the ship. And that's one example of many things I've got to get right when doing multiple implementations of Taka on top of different background technology. So maybe, for example, someone in the future could re-implement Taka on top of Raylib, which already has great web demos, by the way. It's a nice game library that's out there. Let's try this demo and see how big it is to load. We see here that this demo had gzip compressed, about 54k of Wasm, with about 43k gzip compressed of JS support code to bind it into the browser. And it works well. For kicks, let's load a different demo here. So it's 43 and 54. Let's arbitrarily pick a different one. I don't know. So we see for this different example here that the JS is a different size than before, which means it's different JS support code. And I really don't know if that's just because it was a different version of RayLive that was used or if it's every time you build RayLive to Wasm, it only grab the JS you need for that particular app. And so while you presumably could implement Taka in RayLive, whether for native or otherwise, I wanted to just bring this up to emphasize the difference between what something like Taka does versus what these demos are doing. So here's my local demo. Let's go to the one I have uploaded to GitHub Pages. And we see here that I'm loading a certain page with fixed taka.wasm taka.js support code that implements a Taka runtime. It's currently pretty large Wasm. This has the Spear V decoding in it and pretty small JS support code otherwise. The only thing that's different between a couple demos we're going to see is the Taka file that's loaded. Because I don't call it .wasm, GitHub doesn't know that it should try to gzip compress it, but being LZ4 compressed in the first place helps some anyway. And when I load a separate demo here, which is the zig demo with the triangle we saw from earlier, we see that it has 
the exact same wasm and JS file because the runtime is the same. The only thing that's different is it's loading a different Taka binary. Everything else is fixed resources. So that's an example of what Taka is doing by being a player for binaries instead of being a separate full bundle of player and app together. Although hopefully some bundling could be fun to do in the future as well. Anyway, so that's my update for this video. And hopefully it's been interesting. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Also check out the links to Taka, including this web playable demo, which might work on your browser in the video description. Bye y'all.